The Triassic period was a weird time. Just before the dinosaurs truly came into their own, all sorts of unique and strange looking animals were being experimented with at this point, and one of the most bizarre of these evolutionary trials were the Drepanosaurs, small, tree-dwelling reptiles with bird-like heads, chameleon-like bodies, and long prehensile tails ending in big claws. But even amongst these incredibly unusual looking organisms, there was somehow another, even stranger Drepanosaur, Hyperonector limnaeus. The anatomy of this animal was especially peculiar for one of these reptiles, something which seems like it just shouldn't be possible, possessing a tail that wouldn't have been prehensile at all, and lacking a claw, instead being remarkably deep and leaf-shaped. The incredibly bizarre anatomy of Hyperonector has led to a few different ideas for the lifestyle of this organism, but the first suggestion was made in the original paper describing and naming the Drepanosaur back in 2001. In this paper, the authors proposed the hypothesis that this was an aquatic adapted animal, using its deep tail as a paddle to propel itself through water. At first glance, this appears like a pretty reasonable idea. The odd shape of the tail compared to related drepanosaurs would seem to have possibly been an adaptation to locomotion in water, with the paleontologists comparing the overall shape to that of gymnarchid and gymnotid fish, as well as suggesting a similarity to the deepened tails of newts and crocodilians. And there are a few other bits of anatomy that were argued by the authors as being evidence for this sort of lifestyle. For example, Hyperonector possessed relatively quite long limbs, which the authors argued could have been necessary to keep the animal elevated and stop the deepened tail from dragging along the ground when they came ashore. The paleontologists originally describing the reptile also noted that there was no evidence of Hyperonector being capable of raising its tail up at a high angle, and that therefore it's unlikely that this structure acted as a balancing organ for life in the trees. Additionally, the argument was made that since this animal's remains are so abundant in lake deposit beds, this is also in support of an aquatic tendency. However, there are of course many issues with this hypothesis, and it now seems unlikely that Hyperonector was actually swimming about in ancient lakes. But don't worry, it was still a weird animal. There's a more recent 2010 publication which examines the case of this particular Drepanosaur, presenting some good evidence against the aquatic idea, and instead favouring an arboreal or tree-dwelling lifestyle for Hyperonector, like the other Drepanosaurs it was related to while also suggesting the possibility of gliding habits in this species. To begin with, the comparison with the gymnarchid and gymnoted fish proves problematic, since these fish propel themselves by generating an undulating wave with the fins that run along the top and bottom of their bodies, something that an amniote is incapable of doing. So how about the tail's use in a similar fashion to modern crocodilians and newts? Well, this is actually a big problem too, since the anatomy of Hyperonector's unusual tail seems to completely prevent any sort of use as a paddle-like structure. This is due to two main reasons. First, the bits of bone on the tail vertebrae that stick out in front, known as zygopophyses, are very elongated and overlap the adjacent vertebrae a great deal, enveloping their sides and limiting the amount of lateral flexibility in the joints between vertebrae. So the tail of Hyperonector was not really able to move very much from side to side, which would be useful for underwater propulsion, instead being limited to mostly up and down movements. Secondly, the incredible elongated bones under the tail vertebrae, called chevrons, are so long and oriented in such a way that they lie beneath several other vertebrae, up to eight in some cases, as well as running under other chevrons. This would also seem to have made flexion of the tail to the sides pretty difficult to achieve, since any sort of movement between the vertebrae in these directions would have been restricted by the stiffness of the many long rods stacked on top of each other that hung beneath them. So, despite the tail having an overall shape that superficially resembles a paddle, the reason for it looking this way is the very reason it could not have been used as a paddle. In addition, the argument that was made in the original description of Hyperonector, that the reptile could not raise its tail up to a high angle, is actually directly contradicted by a specimen showing this exact orientation, which strangely was even figured in the original description. This particular specimen is believed to be showing the actual anatomical positioning of the tail relative to the body, and therefore the elevation is not the result of any taphonomic processes. So this Drepanosaur was quite capable of lifting its tail above the ground even without the use of its long limbs, as the 2001 paper suggested they were used for. And, as paleontologist Mark Witten points out in his blog post on the subject, since when was tail dragging actually a concern for reptiles anyway, as the aquatic hypothesis claims it would have been for this animal? 
Speaking of the limbs, these structures really don't appear to have been particularly well suited for an aquatic lifestyle. More aquatically inclined tetrapods generally tend to have shorter limbs with expanded and paddle-like hands and feet, whereas Hyperonecta, as mentioned earlier, had relatively elongated limbs, and the hands and feet, though not very well known and with various differing interpretations of what they looked like, certainly did not resemble paddles. And even if you go by the argument that they were elongated in order to stop the tail from getting in the way of terrestrial locomotion, this doesn't really explain why the forelimbs are actually longer than the hind limbs which would result in the creature tilting backwards and the tail being closer to the ground. Instead, a lot of these anatomical features appear to be in support of a tree-climbing lifestyle, like the other drapanosaurs. The elongated forelimbs, coupled with the chameleon-like pectoral girdle, are ideal for climbing, providing the reptile with a wider angle between the limbs in order to support themselves better, by increasing their stability and pushing the centre of mass backwards, reducing the risk that the animal would topple if they lost their grip. The tail, too, despite not being prehensile like in other drapanosaurs, could also have proven very useful in arboreal locomotion, with the rigid structure providing more stability when climbing, possibly acting as some sort of brace to stop the creature falling in the event that the limbs lost their grip. Additionally, it's been suggested that the unique shape of the tail could indicate that this was a kind of display structure, potentially being brightly coloured in life, and the ability to move it vertically could mean that it was raised up by the organism when it displayed. But, things have been taken one step further. The same 2010 publication also suggested the idea that Hyperonecta might, possibly, have been adapted for gliding, or at least, controlled falling. The biggest piece of evidence in favour of this hypothesis is the elongation of the limbs, as well as the fact that the forelimbs are slightly longer than the hind limbs in some cases, which is a good arrangement for keeping a skin membrane stretched out between the limbs. This state of elongated forelimbs is seen in several different groups of gliding and flying tetrapods that use skin membranes, including anomalous, colugos, and pterosaurs, supporting this possibility in Hyperonecta too. Although, this drapanosaur was probably not capable of gliding down from trees over huge distances, if it was able to glide at all, instead likely just parachuting down from high regions without harm. This idea, which has actually been proposed for another species of Drapanosaur in the past, Megalancosaurus, though it seems much more unlikely for that taxon, could also explain the shape of the tail in Hyperonecta. Perhaps the strangely deep, stiff tail could have acted as a sort of rudder, helping to get Hyperonecta into an upright position as it plummeted through the air after having just leapt off a tree, so that the membranes could be engaged and it could fall, with a bit more style, to the ground. Of course, this is all still very hypothetical, as there is currently no direct evidence of gliding membranes being present in this reptile, but it does seem like a more compelling argument than the outdated aquatic hypothesis. Then again, maybe Hyperonecta was just a more generalised version of the arboreal drapanosaurs, restricted to only climbing trees and not falling off them, and perhaps utilising its amazing tail as a striking display feature. Whatever the case ends up being, there is no denying that Hyperonecta is a fascinating and outright silly looking organism, the epitome of Triassic Age weirdness that makes this period in Earth history and animal evolution so incredibly captivating to learn about. Well, thank you for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. If you would like to find out more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you would like to see more from us.